Okay, I would say welcome back to another episode of Tuesday Night Talk, but we're having it on Sunday this week uh, uh, to work in the schedule of my next guest, which I'll be introducing here shortly. And I've been trying to uh, meet up with uh, this gentleman for a while, and we just now got our schedules together where we can uh, make this happen. Uh, good to see everybody. Welcome. Hope everyone's had a had a nice weekend. Uh, and as I always do, I always uh, uh, advertise my book I wrote, uh, my latest one, Kayamishi Bigfoot, Investigating the Oklahoma Sasquatch. If you have not got this one already, it is available on Amazon in ebook or paperback, as well as my first book, uh, The Champagne. Uh, Terror has a name, and it's a fictional book based on a monster in Native American folklore. Uh, also, as always, I'd like to start off thanking our moderator, uh, Kashuga Zentite. She does a great job keeping our chat free of trolls and bots and all that unsavory things so we can enjoy our visit together. And as always, thank you, Cashew. Um, I always talked about my uh, books. And, and guys, I am closing in on 4,000 subscribers, and I never thought I'd get 50 in the first place. So... I appreciate every one of you that has subscribed to my channel. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you are enjoying this, then I please invite your friends to subscribe. Check it out as well. And enough about me. Now I'm going to introduce our guest for this week. Is uh, He is uh, a researcher with the Native Oklahoma Bigfoot Research Organization, as well as a co-organizer of the Honobia or Honubby, as we say in Oklahoma, Bigfoot Conference down in Southeast Oklahoma. Now we were having a little bit, this reason I was a little late coming on is we're having a little bit of audio difficulties and we weren't able to figure out which end it was coming from. So if there's a little bit of static, just bear with us and we'll get this done. But without further ado, here is tonight's guest, uh, Troy Hudson. And uh, how, how you doing, doing Troy? <laughs> Good. And I and I think I think that I think that statics from your end because it wasn't there when I was uh, talking earlier, but we can still hear you. So, um, uh, Troy, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, just by way of introduction. Well, um, I'm born and raised in Southeast Oklahoma. Uh, you know, grew up uh, running around the hills and the mountains of Southeast Oklahoma. Um, spent a lot of time camping, obviously was in the Boy Scouts. That's where I had one of my first experiences. Uh, I don't know what that was. That wasn't on my side. <laughs> there was okay, music or that's all right. Um, you know, I one of my first, in, which I did not know exactly what it was at the time, it wasn't until later in the mm -hmm. years when I realized what it was um, because the word Bigfoot was used quite a bit when I was a child. Uh, a lot of the local people, you know, some people in Oklahoma refer to the Wooly Booger. Um, so, you know, you always had that thing of yet being in the house when the sun goes down, when the street lights come on. But, uh, oh. you know, when... Graduated high school, went in the military, you know, came back to Oklahoma, uh, started working in law enforcement, went to work for the federal government, moved down to Texas. Um, that's when I had a coworker introduce me to uh, a website, which was the BFRO, uh, that they were having a mm -hmm. expedition in Honubby, and he was trying to pronounce it. And so I got up, went in his office and looked at it and realized it was Honubby. And like, well, that's interesting because that's not too far from where the Boy Scout camp was, where I had my experience. And, mm. you know, put one and two together, went on the expedition, uh, became a member of BFRO, an investigator, uh, eventually was operating, organizing uh, and leading their expeditions in Oklahoma, Texas, and Arkansas through the years. And that's how I came into starting my relationship with the Honan B. Bigfoot Festival. It was in 2008. 
Um, okay. Got to know now, was that some of the people there, the organizers. And um, that's kind of how I got started in helping. And then it wasn't until the latter part of 2009 when I was asked to go ahead and because the organization that was organizing the conference then, uh, there was mm -hmm. some type of falling out and they stepped back. And in the latter part of 2009, that's when I was asked by the, the chamber and the board to organize and run the conference. And then we, uh, my organization as well as, you know, we took over organizing um, the conference in 2010 and 11. Of course, we know mm -hmm. that uh, there was some things that happened, so it wasn't in 11 and 12, or I'm sorry, 12 and 13. The conference came back in 14 under Farland, um, his direction. I was working with him, helping him uh, through that, and I've been with, you know, with the conference and the festival, you know, basically since about 2008. Okay. When was the first year they had that? In 2005. It was actually held at the uh, community center where the community center and the, and the uh, senior citizen center is there uh, at, okay. in Honebby down by the river. Okay. Now you mentioned there uh, earlier too, you were a, a part of the BFRO. Um, yes. What, what years were you in that? Uh, from 2004 to about 2009. <clears throat> oh, okay. So, uh, so you know some of the guys that was on the TV show then, Finding Bigfoot. We, the Oklahoma, and a lot of people don't know this, but the Oklahoma, Honeybee was supposed to be in one of the first episodes of, of that. There was going to be some filming going on. Um, but I had some, some work things going on with work and, you know, I had a, a death in the family and there was just some other, uh, political things that kind of got in the way. And I stepped away from that, from BFRO and, um, you know, it's still, it's a great bunch of, you know, it, it's, you know, some guys and, and the ladies and the, and the gentlemen of BFRO, there's still some outstanding people in the organization, but, um, you know, we, I moved on and there was a, a, a small group of us from Oklahoma that said, well, we can just start our own organization because we were being asked to speak. I was being asked to speak at various other community functions, um, some tribal events, and we were always kept being asked, what's the name of your group? What's the name of your group? And <laughs> I was like, well, we don't really, you know, we, we all belong to an organization at one time and some of us, you know, we just you know, we don't have a name. And then it just kept, it kept coming, it kept coming. So we thought, well, maybe we ought to come up with a name. Uh, some of us, you know, there's at that time, just about everybody in the organization uh, belongs or affiliated with a tribe of some sort. So mm -hmm. that's like, well, you know, we'll come up with a native Oklahoma because most of us were all born and raised in Oklahoma, you know, the native Oklahoma Bigfoot Resource Organization and it stuck. Um, so even though the acronym is N-O-B-R-O, -O, no bro, it, it sometimes has a comical, uh, um, way about how it's introduced. Well, I, I come up with something comical with no bro. That's what a Sasquatch says to you when you ask if you can take his picture. No, bro. <laughs> so, well, I, but I, yeah, that, that's <laughs> Okay, I didn't catch that part. Uh, no, I, what I was saying is that's right, because you know there's been a few times <laughs> something will happen, and we will, and then we will say no, no, bro, they're real. Yeah, no, bro, that's <laughs> what happened. So it it has its it has its place in there sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they uh, have that in uh, cashew. She put your uh, um organization name up there for everybody too if they want to check out with a uh, a website home on there so uh 
y'all haven't checked out the native Oklahoma Bigfoot research research organization website, we'll pay them a visit too. Um, all right, what else here? Then now, no bro, um, you guys have uh, members like all over the state, isn't uh, Evans Bailey one of your your guys? Yes, actually, he 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 takes care of the northwest and the north central mm -hmm. part. So we have we have roughly about thirteen investigators that are all over the state in where they are where they live. That's kind of the area. Uh, you know, I think on our on our website shows a district, but that's the areas that they kind of have. They're the subject matter experts. In those areas, you know, once a year. They all come to Honubi and we have a training program for new investigators as well as some of the veteran investigators. It's kind of like how, you know, how we do in the law enforcement world. We have in-service training and we have a basic training. So we've had a few people, you know, that has the interest in joining and we have a program set or you know, not trying to make it sound bad against other organizations. It's just that when we have investigators that go to a property or go do an investigation at um, a location, you know, it's all mm -hmm. about that presence that you have. You know, you you coming from the law enforcement background, understand that that first appearance, mm -hmm. that first communication you have, um, you know, they wear they wear a polo with their name on it. And the logo, you know, we have business cards and they're, you know, we, I think we even, I think I've been told that had law enforcement approach them in the town where some of our guys were doing investigation wondering who they were. So they thought they were government agents or something because they were, you know, they were very <laughs> professional. Black. So, um, and most of our organization deals with is public education, as well as, um, you know, doing investigations on property where there may be what some people refer to as habituational uh, incidents that occur. So we work a lot with people that have situations where it's causing them um, some stress. They don't know what they're dealing with. Um, they don't know how to handle it. Uh, because they're coming around their property, coming around their homes, you know, in, in the beginning of some of them, you know, they feel they're being harassed, you know, their, their livestock, their, um, you know, property, they, they feel uh, some feel of a threat is occurring. And then our investigators, what they do is most, and, and one thing to note just about, so and we have a few new investigators, but all of our investigators has been with, no bro for the last you know four or five years they've all have an experience they've all had a sighting so they've all seen one and some seen multiple ones and they have dealt with their own uh encounters in a way that they're able to help uh, the eyewitnesses or the landowner or the property owner or the whatever the case may be so we've had some fairly good success in helping those homeowners or landowners as well as a lot of them are doing presentations at public events. I know we we have a lot of stuff going on with the Oklahoma City Library. Um, you know, we've we've had some tribal events in different parts of the the state where I speak at, and some of our other gentlemen mm -hmm. speak at. Um, I've been to Wisconsin and spoke at a tribe up there, and we've been just before COVID started. I was invited to uh, one in West, uh, Kansas. I'm sorry, in Kansas. Uh, Potawatomi, um, but COVID kind of got in the way, so that put a, a lot of holds on. Um, I see a question. I think somebody has. <laughs> yeah, and this is this is well, this will segue with right when you were saying what some people don't know what they're dealing with. And one of my questions always asked, of course, none of us I don't think really know, but in your opinion. Somebody backs you in a corner and just says, Troy, what do you think that these creatures are? And, you know, the things that we hear is uh, years ago, the consensus was a remnant of Gigantopithecus. I've never subscribed to that personally. No disrespect to those that did. Others, uh, they're a type of human. Others, some kind of paranormal entity. 
And I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. And what what is your opinion on that? Well, my personal opinion, um, my observations, I've had a few investigations that has lasted over four years. I have property where I spend time at now. And that's going on almost, coming on almost 20 years. Um, okay we've lost troy there your voice is lagging somebody somebody in the ether did not want us to hear that answer Well, we might have to uh, let Troy log back on. Um, okay, uh, Troy, we can't hear you. Um, you're you frozen up. I'm going to take you off, and you need to and and log back on if you if you can. Can you hear me? Okay, we lost signal with Troy. We got some, uh, Troy, if you can still hear me on, on your end, uh, uh, log back into the show. We got we got several questions popping up here for you about, uh, about no bro and certainly want to get get your uh, outlook on that sometimes i'll tell you what if internet can mess up it will mess up at the most inopportune uh times um and i know i'm on still on good uh so um maybe troy will get his connection back pretty quick so uh I'm on, Chris. Good to see. You. Okay, there he is. There you are. No clue. Yeah, that that is on your end, though. Okay, here's a very, uh, very good. Uh, go ahead and finish your thought there, um, because yeah, we didn't get any of that. So, so basically, you know, really quick before something else happens. You know, I've been in this uh, over 15 years hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of investigations. I've had a lot of long-term investigations at that sites where uh, these guys, I say these guys, you know, these, these um, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, you know, whatever the common mainstream terminology is uh, where they're around my involvement with the DNA project, Sasquatch genome project. And yeah. I mean, personally, they, there are people. They are another tribe okay. of people. They have the language. Um, they have children. They have a hierarchy in their family structure. Some live. Along with other family groups, some live apart. Some live by the status. in their family, you know, family tree, their family hierarchy. Um, but not all culture just as much as ours. They're non-materialistic. They don't need the things that we do. They don't need to know how to run a computer. They don't need, they don't need the luxuries that we have. Um, you know, having the knowledge about their DNA and knowing the things that I've seen and listening to tribal elders talk and just hearing people through the years. Um, I mean, there are, there are people, but not all of them are the same. You know, like with the DNA, you know, the ones in Louisiana are not the same as the ones in Oklahoma. And the ones in Oklahoma aren't the same as the ones in Florida. The ones in Louisiana ain't the same as the ones in Florida. I mean, they're, you know, the DNA is there that shows that that they're not all the same. You know, they would be kind of cousins of each other. 
but you know, our behaviors, you know, a lot of people refer to that down in Texas, Oklahoma, our Bigfoots are mean. Well, I've never seen that. I've seen things. If you're doing something wrong, you're doing something they don't like. Yeah. They're going to get mad. They're going to get mean, but I mean, Yeah, so hopefully that right? answers. <laughs> right. So I think that probably uh, the way you uh, uh, relayed that would answer the question that Mon Chris says, what's the no-grow stance on taking a specimen? Uh, I'm assuming you're in the no-kill camp. Well, that that is correct. That is, that is very correct. You know, outside of if I didn't have the knowledge – if I didn't have the relationships I do with some of the tribes and some of the elders and listening to some of the tribal communities talk uh, about, about them, about the Bigfoot, <clears throat> I'd still be in the no kill regardless because I, you know, for me, like, you know, even being a hunter, I don't hunt for sport for deer you know, if we're yeah, gonna we're gonna be hunting, we're not at all. We're if we're hunting, we need it for food, not out of the sport. And being that, you know, the Bigfoots are a people. They have language. They have children. You know, a lot of times their children's with them. I mean, it's just the same as, right. in my opinion, as you're killing somebody else that's running around out here. It just, it doesn't make any, Hey, Troy. You know, go ahead. Uh, some, uh, somebody, Donald Fuller said to help your audio, uh, turn your video off and just go audio if you can. That might take care of the problem. If you can do that. Okay. Can you hear me? Did that work? Did it work? Uh, I can hear you fine. Okay. Well, Okay, so yeah, I'm well, I'm it doesn't here. matter, Troy. It's still doing that. Yeah, you can bring your video back on. It's still, you're still cutting out a little bit, but we can hear you for the best part. So, um, uh, we do have a question here. And, and by the way, I'm with you 100%. I don't, I don't kill anything unless it's a direct threat or I'm going to eat it. Uh, I, I do not hunt for sport myself. That's not knocking anybody that does. That's, that's me personally. Uh, John Hodges, this is my friend from down the Southeast Oklahoma he says, Troy, do you have to be Native American to be an investigator for no bro? No, no, we have quite a few. We've brought on a, quite a few, uh, I guess you'd say non-native, uh, you know, interested uh, individuals that wanted to join organizations. It, it does not have to be, um, but it, it's not a requirement and, and, and the answer is no. It's just that we do work in and around quite a few of um, tribal Okay, we've lost uh, Troy again there. Uh, there. Well, I'm sort of back. I'm... Um, yeah, we lost you. Come back, log back on, uh, Troy. It's, uh, it's, it's, it is on your end. It's not, not here. Cause I'm still getting all the chats and everything really good. Sometimes this internet's just, uh, um, yeah, I'll tell you what, somebody mentioned up there that the internet's bad all over the country. And it's, a. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm not on the, I, I was all over AT and T last week, and they got my issues uh, fixed finally. But now we're having uh, Troy's having some issue with his. But we will get it. Let me see if there's any questions here. So, um, um, catch up in the chat here. So, John, he did answer your question. You do not have to be Native American to be a member of the native oklahoma bigfoot research organization um well there's francesca hello francesca uh francesca is a 
I believe a moderator on a, a Carrie's uh, Bigfoot Odyssey, if I remember correctly. Welcome. Uh, let's see, there he is. We'll get him. We'll get Troy back on here. And he's back. <laughs> well, I know. So, uh, I know. I noticed the internet. I mean, I got full bars, but I noticed the internet's running really slow. Um, yeah, that's that's what too. When I in, I interviewed uh, Tanya Kordak, who has the you know the Bigfoot Museum in Tallahena, and hers was showing full bars, and we had to go to a phone interview before it was over. Right. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, uh, not to assume it, everybody here knows what you're talking about when you were speaking about DNA, Troy. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were involved in the the DNA, the uh, genome project that Melba Ketchum. Is that correct? Were you involved in that? Yes. Yes. Okay. At what yes, end? Collecting potential or? Um. So basically, she back in 2009. She was looking for a local investigator to do some field work for her. And she was wanting somebody that, you know, that could be trusted. And working with that Kentucky project, of course, you know, the Kentucky project had a lot of BFRO um, connections with. And I was running a similar investigation in North Texas. And the gentleman named Dennis o, that was working with me, that was working the Kentucky project, was working with Melba and said, well, you can reach out to Troy. He's law enforcement and does this. And that's how we got connected. And that's how we um, got together. And I've been working with her ever since. Um, I've seen the samples. I saw the Justin Samasia sample. So if people want to throw mud at the, supposedly it was a bear. Well, I'll tell you, I saw the sample. My Actually, myself and one of the other investigators were in her lab back in 2000 that would have been 2010 um we saw the sample so people can say whatever they think it is but there was a lot of mud slung it's still being slung at dr ketchum but her stuff was 100 percent real i don't see how you cannot okay. have a three and of course i'm not a dna person but i've had to learn all this since then but i don't mm -hmm. see how you could have three nuclear genomes and not prove beyond a reasonable doubt, she has more than reasonable doubt to go into a court of law to prove something exists. But we okay. know scientific world, we know the media. Well, we lost we know, you again, uh, I lost, Troy. I lost you too. I lost you too. Okay. Well, there you are. Okay, yeah, I'm and I'm with you there. I I am not in any stretch of the imagination uh, know much of anything about DNA. Um, but like you said, there has been a lot of mud slung there, and I've stayed completely out of that. I've read uh, some of Melba's uh, work, and of course, I believe Scott Carpenter was also involved in that uh, a little bit, and I've I've spoken to him a few times. But yeah, I mean. It's intriguing. I'll, I'll give you that. Of course, when you say you saw the sample, do you mean you saw the creature that left the sample? Or. Well, well, well let's let's take the Justin Samasia uh, incident where he shot one um, and removed a sample from the leg of one. And it was shipped to Dr. Ketchum. And so we were at her lab uh, working with her on, 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 the, on the project, not on that particular sample, but working with her on some other stuff. And she asked us if we wanted it. And now at that time, I had no clue who Justin Samasia was. I had no clue the scenario. But she asked if we wanted to see the sample. So she took us into the lab under the hood where the where the lab is and showed us that sample so we physically saw it um you know i i have seen enough of these guys or enough you know i've seen enough of the bigfoots to know 
you know, what does a bear look like? What does a Bigfoot look like? And their body texture, their hair, their skin is completely different. It's, it's, I mean, I know it's hard to try to fathom that, but I mean, you know, their skin's kind of leathery. You know, that's how they're able to withstand those temperatures other than their metabolism is slower than ours, which, as you know, a, a heavy person that has a slow metabolism is able to keep their body heat. You know, they're, 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 they're burning their calories slower and they're able to maintain body heat in those extreme temperatures. Um, but, you know, the Kentucky project uh, that was working parallel to my Texas project. Some of the samples came from some of those videos that some people have seen that's, that's, you know, that's kind of made it out into the internet. Um, you know, she has those samples and then they have video of them. So what did people want? People wanted video and people wanted DNA. Well, mm. you got it, but they still weren't satisfied. Okay. Uh, here's a, Here's a question here, um, and uh, it says, and there is not a Troy and David's experience here because we were not there at the same time. Um, what was Troy and David's experience with the casino? And it was not Chickasaw, by the way. Um, there is no Chickasaw or Chickasha. Uh, I have got my glasses on, so I misread that. There's not a Chickasha casino footage, but basically what they're talking about is what's it referred to as casino footage. Uh, yeah, you gave the name of it out. I've never given the name out, but um, basically, uh, most of y'all's heard my story back in 2000, late summer 2000. I was the first investigator on the scene. I was uh, uh, a contact for the BFRO. Uh, later that evening, Roger Roberts, who was the Oklahoma contact at that time, uh, came on. So um, what it was is a, a, basically a Bigfoot came up across that parking lot and tried to get into a grease trap. Now, everybody's heard my story and involvement in that many times. So we'll, we'll let Troy... Uh, talk about his because he came on the BFRO sometime a little later than that, I believe, if I'm correct. But I don't want to play fill in the blanks there. So, so basically, um, there was a report from one of the ladies that worked there in the kitchen um, at the time. I got to talking to her. Um, she had submitted a report. Cause she was trying to find out what the status was. So basically working with her, she saw the video. Um, somebody there was working, showed her the video. Her father is a prominent um, elder in the tribe. So I was working different angles. As you know, there was a lot of, um miss not really oh, i don't want to use the word misdirection but there was a lot of different sides of did the video still exist did somebody have a copy of it did the truck get rid of it mm -hmm. um you know as well as i do some of the some of the stuff that that was going on back then um but of course as we know nobody everybody that works at the casino now was not working there uh turnover is is quite high Right. in a casino in some in some regards um it's an interesting uh event but that occurs quite often on tribal land um there's various mm. other buildings that um sometimes um are in a geographical location where the big guys walk in or around where employees and visitors do see them. Um, we have several um, locations that we are working with other tribal members to, you know, help them understand certain things. And it gives our investigators some experience as well as, you know, uh, some knowledge of, of what goes on. 
because you know as well as I do, a Bigfoot does not recognize where a tribal boundary is, where a county line is, where the city limits are. Unless it's are their own. In. Right. Unless it's their own right. tribal boundary, I guess. Um, right. Right. But yeah, and it, uh, and I don't know by the time. Uh, now, what year did you say you came on? It was in the BFRO 2000? 2000, 2004. 2004. So were they still at that time having uh, issues? Because I never investigated any further there because there were, as you know, too, using that term, there's a lot of people making a nuisance out of themselves on the tribal uh, property there right after 2000. They just finally just kind of shut it off to, to most people. Um, were there no, still issues there going was, on there was, regarding that? There there was some residual. There was a um, young lady, a single mom with kids that, that lived north of that area. Um, she don't mm -hmm. live there now, but she lived north of that area, and she was having some stuff going on at her house. And that's how this lady that I was working with and communicating with that had worked at the casino at the time, she knew the this uh, single mom. And I was working with her to try to help her understand, you know, to be a little bit more calm at night and to understand, you know, what the do's and the don'ts are um, and how you can live peacefully and not have to worry about them. You know, it and that was I want to say that was probably around the 2005, 2006 time frame. Then the lady, the okay. single mom had moved and. You know, there's a lot of developments going on out in that area since then. So, okay. I'm not going to ask you any name or anything, but th would this be the, the young lady that you introduced me to that moved away from there? Yes. Yes. Not in person, but you gave me her email and to talk to her. Okay. Yes. So I know. Yeah. She, she yep. doesn't live a whole, a whole lot of miles from me actually. So, uh, and right. I did speak to yep. her via, via email a few times. So, uh, Troy, I am going to try to. We've got a good number in chat. We got 66 people in here. So uh, um, I'm going to try to catch up on some of the questions uh, uh, to you here. We got uh, Malcolm. This is a personal friend of mine from uh, Southeast Oklahoma. Says, What's the process of joining NoBro? So <clears throat> on, our, on our website, under the, uh, the members, where you can see the members, where it shows. Uh, myself, Ryan, um, D, Emily, you'll see our emails. You can email Ryan or myself, Ryan White or myself. There, our emails are there where our pictures are at and where our, our small bios are. And then you can send us an email and then we can start a dialogue um, and tell you kind of how we, how we do things. Because basically when somebody joins and if they join after we have already had one of our training sessions, we pair them up with one of the local. If, if they're in the area, you know, we can pair them up with them to help start getting them kind of brought in. And then when we have our training, then everybody comes down for the training. And then there's still a little bit of time where they're going to work with another investigator before they're kind of let out on their own. So they kind of feel comfortable and going and doing an investigation. Um, and at, at the same time, they can see how we do it because again, you know, we're not showing up in a pair of coveralls and a, you know, redneck hat or anything. We're trying to be at least professional and be presentable and you know, give a good you know, provide a good customer service to the to the people that have the uh, stuff that's going. On. You only got one chance for a first impression, right? Exactly. So, um, okay, Will Star. Well, there's my friend from up Ohio way, Will Star Mysteries. Uh, welcome, Will. Uh, there's a lady in the woods. She's down there as well. Uh, in Oklahoma. Um, see. Uh, 
trying to get caught up on any any questions. Everybody there, I, I do my best to get to everybody's questions. Uh, just please put them in caps. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just assuming this guy uh, is making this complimentary. Troy says, Troy's a special guy in my opinion. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and let's see, Troy, what is your opinion on, because like, this is, goes back to one of the things that you were saying, people will say, well, the ones in the South are mean, the ones further Northwest are more genteel in nature and stuff. How dangerous do you think the non-provoked, I'm like, I'm taking out anybody that shoots at a Bigfoot and gets something smashed, they had it coming, in my opinion, if they're doing it just for the heck of it. But um, what do you think the unprovoked Sasquatch, are they dangerous in general? I would, you know, I would say that they can be, they can have a bad day just like we have a bad day. And there's <laughs> been times I've worked I've worked with a few people that they say they have a, a rogue Bigfoot that just has a bad attitude because he's he's always hooting and hollering, screaming, growling, makes the dogs all get been out of shape. He's tearing stuff up, knocking down the fence, and, you know, it, exactly. Guy. Exactly. <laughs> so you have that you have apple. And, well, think about it. You have something – that can travel through the woods in the dark without the use of night vision or any type of light that can navigate the terrain at a speed at which we can even only fathom. And the fact that they bend trees over and snap them the size of your leg um, and shake cars and just about shake somebody out of their seat in, in a car and the fact that they are so, you know, I've, I've heard it been described as a ballerina, a ninja ballerina in the woods, like an elephant ballerina. Um, massive, but almost makes no sound. In my opinion, that's very dangerous. But it's also yeah, how I... you, 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 you take that and you accept it and you do, you know, it, it's... What I've learned with them is they're like anything else related to our society. You know, you treat them with respect, treat them with, you know, um, you know, again, I guess just say if you treat them with respect, they're going to treat you with respect. If you throw things at them and point lasers, you know, at their face or shine a light in their direction, well, I mean, how would you feel if you were in the woods and somebody was doing that to you? Well, I know how I would feel if somebody was taking shots at me or something. But, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm going to return fire. Here's a question. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know uh, for sure. But, um, yeah, and I, th I think a lot, you know, and I've shared the opinion, at least to, to this point uh, with you, that I do think they are another tribe of some at least extremely closely closely related uh, type of people. And a lot of the American and Native American tribes uh, treat them as such as well. So that being said, there's good people and there's bad people. And the difference is one of these things decides to have a bad day. He's got a lot of strength to carry that off as well as the uh, stealth. He's talking about how fast they can move through the woods. They don't necessarily make any noise you know, unless they just want to right. from from what I have uh, found myself. Troy, I'm going to let you answer this question. I'm going to step away from the camera for just a little bit. It says, uh, my friend John Hodges says, Troy, where did you say your Boy Scout camp was and what was your encounter? And I will be right back. Okay. Uh, the the camp was Camp Tom Hill. Uh, it's near Tallahanna, Oklahoma. Um, it's nestled up there in the mountains. And the encounter was during the day we could hear something knocking on wood, which as I know now, obviously is tree knocks. 
but this was going on for several hours. It would be like a knock in the valley and it would echo 20 minutes later, another knock. So, you know, a couple of us asked one of the scout uh, leaders that was there that lives in that area said, you know, you know, someone's chopping wood and they're like, Oh, don't worry about that. It's just a, it's just an old man that lives up in the mountains. He's cutting wood. And we're like, well, he's cutting a piece of wood about every 20 minutes, one at a time. So later on one of the nights, uh, myself and my tent mate that we were sleeping in, you know, that was sharing a tent with, we decided to, to get, go out and actually go try to find this guy that was cutting wood one piece at a t- I'm for hours on end. Um, so we never located, but we got turned around. You know, woods obviously make a noise because, you know, here's a bunch, here's two, you know, 12 year old, 13 year olds that are <laughs> walking around the woods at night with no flashlight. We, and it was a full moon, and we decided that we better get back before somebody realizes we're gone. Well, we had walked through the creek bed. We knew our way, working our way back in that area. Well, we come across a small opening in the woods where it's a small, it's not a field, but it was an open area where the moonlight shines down and illuminates that that ground. We were coming up to the tree line. So when we go to cross that, there was someone standing across from us, but the moon was behind them. So it was only casting a shadow. could only see that line. Well, okay. we freaked out. Troy, we ran we back lost. down into the creek bed. I'm still here. You still, okay. I'm still here. You see we me? We missed that one sentence. You said what well, looked like a shadow or something, and then you froze up. So, you know, basically it looked like a man. The moon was behind okay. the, the figure. But I do remember it was very, very tall and it was very, very big. Um, it just was standing her arms down by its side. I mean, you could see okay. from what I recall, you know, I'm I'm in my 50s now. So that was a long time ago. Uh, it was massive. But long story short, when we got back to our tent, we decided to peek out to see where everybody was at. And all the adults were still in their cots around the campfire. So we realized it wasn't it wasn't one of them. Well, when we got home, I was living in Henrietta at the time. When we got home, my mom had made a mention, said, hey, you boys know that someone called the news or the news said that a lady said that she saw a Bigfoot across her back pasture. And that's right next to that Boy Scout camp. And so me and my friend that was in the tent that saw what we saw, we were looking at each other like, hmm. Maybe that's what we saw, but that was that encounter back then, you know, hearing things as a kid, not really making anything to it, but it wasn't until, you know, I got into this and all those stuff that I heard as a kid and some of the things, you know, we, I saw at the Boy Scout camp and just some of the weirdness that went on that I'm pretty sure a lot of that activity I was exposed to, but just didn't, had no clue what it was. Just didn't know what it was. Well, and this and this may go right into your uh, thing there. Uh, Landlocked Viking says, how close do you believe you have ever been to one of these things? Oh, uh, let's see. Multiple times at the property in Texas where we were doing the, um, where I had that for almost five year investigation probably with and and actually a couple of those i did not know one was standing that close until it was one of the kids on the property was telling me that one was standing there so knowing that one was there that close proximity probably from what i understand according to the the kids that were living there as well as somebody was there with me that was also helping do the investigation. They were part of the BFRO. 
um, said it was within arm's reach. Um, the one that stands out the most uh, was in Oklahoma. Was actually not too far from your neck of the woods. It was in Cole County. Um, we had a moonlight. There were several of us in the woods, but we were kind of scattered. Well, one of the other guys um, that hangs out with me a lot, uh, he was leaning back against his four-wheeler, and I was walking down the trail because we kept hearing noises, and we were seeing movement in the woods, so I was walking down the trail uh, just to kind of you know, get away from everybody and get away from the noise so I could hear. And as I was walking, I was looking off to my right because there was a lot of movement about 40, 50 yards in the woods to my right. Um, I would step and stop, listen, look. Take one of my last steps forward. Okay, there you are. You're back. Okay, go ahead. Um, as I was taking one of my last steps forward, something to my left, low to the ground, shuffled. As I turned my head to look, I probably could have, I, I would have had to have leaned out. But something that was about three feet high spun and ran off back into the thicker part of the foliage. This was during the, the springtime. So there was the, there was leaves on the trees, but it ran off okay. to my left back into the tree line from the trail. And so I turned around and darted back to where my buddy was standing. And as I got back to him, he was laughing. And all he asked was, I didn't think, he goes, I thought you were going to walk right up on it and shake its hand. And I'm like, well, I didn't know it was standing there. And the only thing I was thinking is if that little one was standing there, mom and dad or big brother had been standing probably not too far away. And I didn't want to be standing there. And then everybody realized we were standing that close to each other. That's why I decided to turn and go back over to where he was at. And to this day, we still laugh at it because, I mean, I, I told him, I said, dude, you could have told me. He just he was wanting to see what was going to happen. That's basically his story. He was just standing there with his arms crossed, wondering how this was going to play out. Hmm. Uh, Gary Spock's saying something to you there, uh, Roy. You can see him on the screen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you everybody else that has served their country and still serve. And uh, D... <laughs> I, I, I don't know what a hoax is or if she's trying to say joke. She says BFRO or a hoax. Well, you know, one thing I, I will say, D, I, I am, I do, I am not ever on this show going to uh, put anybody down. Uh, what I will say about the BFRO is back in the day, they had the most comprehensive database of sightings that you could go to in the whole, in the whole country. So that, that would be a positive thing that I could uh, say about them back, especially a few years ago. Uh, you could pretty much, and, and there are a couple of reports on there uh, that uh, the pe person investigate them, investigating that sighting or whatever will have my name on it, though I was never actually a member of the BFRO. I was just a contact for them. Uh, 20, Troy, where does time go, man? That was 20 <laughs> That was 20 years ago or over 22 years ago now. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think when I was, when I was there, I think they had, I think there was probably just between 30 to 35,000 reports in the, in a database. Yeah. Um, here's the, and, and you might have already answered this with that last one, but no, it said, have you ever come upon where you thought or knew one was close and your better judgment stopped you? I there's, guess from approaching. There's been a few times, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's been a few times that I've known and, and even, you know, fairly recently because there's a couple areas where we spend a lot of time in the woods. We, we, we have an area where we, we do have a fire. 
Um, and we usually have the fire merely just because a lot of the times it's the winter time and we just need something to warm up next to. It doesn't cause any problems. It doesn't hinder any of the activity. But there's times where you walk away, you know, just to kind of look around because, you know, you hear stuff, you know, moving to your left, moving to your right. And you got to get away from the fire because, you know, you can see. Uh, and there's times, you know, one standing right there. He, you know, for a fact, you can hear and you can see the body. You can see the outline. And there's just that. I mean, I, I guess I respect him to a part that. They had their space. I have my space, you know, and I tell people this a lot, especially sometimes if you're the only one sitting by the fire and you hear somebody moving behind you, but you know where everybody else is at. I mean, it's, it may sound silly, but you just, sometimes you turn and go, Hey, look, you're getting a little bit too close. I give you your space. You give me my space because sometimes it's a little unnerving. And I know, you know, this day, but it's a little unnerving when you have something that's 10 feet, nine feet tall, five, six, seven, eight hundred yeah. pounds that can snap a twig. You know, even though you know there's been there's there's been dozens of opportunities. You've been in the woods by yourself hundreds of times. They could have had those opportunities if they ever wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> and last night actually. But you just gotta, you know, you gotta respect it. Yeah. You just gotta respect it. I mean yeah, that's that's what uh, I've said on here. There, I started doing these podcasts this summer because it was just too darn hot to get out in the woods. Uh, yesterday was the first day we've had here in this part of the country in over a month that it wasn't over 100. It was down in the low 80s. So yesterday I went down to the Kaimishi Mountains and uh, and uh, did some walking around and stayed there till after dark and uh, had a an interesting time I'll, I'll leave it at that for the moment um keith mcdonald troy have you ever heard the voice of a bigfoot or a credible recording of one we uh one of the that 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 i mean he became one of my close friends we're we're, we're pretty much we're in the woods most of the time we're usually together and through my experience, I realize trail cameras video is not they these these guys are smart. They know what's going on. They know and it's just not worth trying to suffer the agony of trying to get video and audio. But we do spend a lot of time of putting recorders out. We 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 had the experiences that, I, that obviously they are watching. They know everything you're doing because Here's proof. We've done some studies of ourselves of, all right, we're going to take a recorder. We're going to have three recorders. <clears throat> and we're going to put one at one edge of the property, one at the other edge of the property, and one clear across on the other side, which, you know, we have to use our four-wheelers to get around. <clears throat> so we put the recorders out. We say the, the date, the time, the location, our names, and we put it in a Ziploc bag. Um, Ziploc just keeps the humidity off of it. Right. It's pretty common that when we go back and listen to the videos, you can hear us talking and joking. You hear the full fire up and drive off. Within a minute, sometimes maybe three minutes, something is picking that recorder up. Okay, and we lost you, Troy. You might wait a little bit and let your internet catch up because we messing with it. And you, I lost you right when you when said it's you put back. It's put back in a in a spot where we didn't put it. You know, it's put back because we kind of take a picture of what the location in. And we'll take a picture of it so we come back. Yeah, your internet's lagging behind you a little bit. There. I'm here. Uh, okay. Uh, we got the part where you could tell something had been picking up the recorder and had put it back. So. 
Yeah, your internet just yeah, I mean, trying we, to lag a little bit hot there. Maybe we'll have to maybe we'll have to do this again where the internet is not interfering. Well, we're for the biggest part, it's just it's just uh, crapped out a, a few little times there, but we're we got a good interview anyway, uh, for sure. Right. I'm tying to uh uh da, 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 let's see yeah anybody's got any uh questions uh, uh for troy here put them all in caps and i'll do my best i know i inadvertently i'll miss one once in a while but i do my best to get to all of them uh troy speaking of vocalizations what is the most common um type of vocalization vocalization you've heard that you attribute to a sasquatch screams whistles whoops what would be the most common thing that you've heard down in southeast Oklahoma? I'll I'll put it down in that area. Uh, long house, long house. Okay. Here's one of your buddies. He's got the answer. Squatch Ranger says Bigfoot is messing up the Wi-Fi signal. They don't want their secrets told. <laughs> well. We've had some weirdness happen with that before. So if if you told me that there was a monkey riding a unicorn playing a banjo in the yard right now, I wouldn't even laugh at it. Well, if there was a monkey riding a unicorn playing a banjo, it would be down in the Kaimishi Mountains. No. <laughs> uh I mean that affectionately. That's my favorite part of the state. Absolutely favorite part. Um, right. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, and uh, Francesca there. Like I say, Francesca is a, a moderator on some of the other channels. She does a great job. Uh, thank you for informing us, Troy, and having patience. Yes, and I appreciate that too. Like I said, I've been trying to corner Troy for the last several months, and we just got our schedules lined up where we can make it make it happen. You know, and there's a there's a mutual friend of ours, Troy, a live wire, Mark. You know, I believe be, now. I believe Troy. Uh, I, Troy, you investigated some of that on his place as well, didn't you? Yes, yes. Um, we were lucky enough that we were going up the day, the day that I was contacted. Um, the next day, we were actually going through that area, and we were able to stop and start working with him. And um, but, you know, the uniqueness about it, his situation goes on all across the country. Things like, like that happen a lot more than what people think. Um, and that's where we tend to, that's kind of where our meat and potatoes are with our organization that we're able to help, um, you know, people like him and other people that have those type of situations going on because, you know, they don't know who to reach out to. Um, so we were lucky enough and, and, you know, we were, we were blessed to help him and we've, we've helped other people since, since that. You know, we, again, you know, those things go on a lot more than what people think. Yeah, that is, but yeah, Mark, uh, I think, uh, now, if I remember correctly, and Mark can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe he reached out to you guys first, and then shortly after that, he reached out to me, and I came down there as well, because I remember him, uh, uh, talking when I when I first met him uh, down there, he was uh, talking about um, the help that you had uh, given him down there as well. So, and I think that's where I first uh, really heard about uh, what you were doing. Uh, so, uh, let's see what we got here. And if any, and Mark, if I uh, got any of that wrong, correct me in the chat. Uh, here's an interesting from one from Mark Troy. Uh, said, "Ask Troy about kids with autism and seeing Sasquatch." 
when I was with BFRO, I was working a lot of cases where a family lives in a very rural area, and it's usually the kids were seeing the Bigfoots first, and that's kind of what happened with the Texas site that I was working for several years. <clears throat> the kids were seeing them probably for months before the parents ever took notice and started trying to figure out what's going on. But while I was doing those investigations, as each case kept coming up, I started realizing that I needed to look at the family, not the Bigfoot. Why is this family out of four other homes in a, in a rural area, why are they are the ones they're having this visitation where the other ones are not. So when I started paying more attention, started looking at my, my uh, case notes, I started realizing that the children, this one child, autism, okay. this one down syndrome, this one autism, this one savant, this one down syndrome. And I started wondering what is the uniqueness about that? And then I started, you know, it, it took a while to figure it out that the other properties, the children at those properties did not have on. So, it made me think is our cities interpret, understand, or see, or they just know there's something about this child that's different than the rest of the other children that live in, in the area? Well, and, and by the way, Troy, um, Mark says you came there in December 26, 2019, and I came in March. So I was, I was right on your heels uh, when he contacted me. And he said his daughter was, it says here, if you can read that, my daughter was diagnosed with autism after we moved from Oklahoma. So that was something he didn't, they were not aware of when all that was going on. Right. I, I didn't, I didn't tell you this, Troy, the first, the first time I, I went to that property, uh, I drove up, met Mark, and I drove through a mud puddle. <clears throat> And his daughter come but, out, took one look at my pickup, walked back in, and got a got a washcloth, and started wiping my tire off. Anyway, I I missed part of that. The, you say the big guy knew. I believe Troy said the big guy. Yeah, knew, I mean, right? I, I think they knew. Maybe yeah. that's the reason why they were such a fascination yeah the big guy i think they knew because there was such a fascination that they had with with her okay here's another question here and this is one that i've been asked and uh again this is my friend will has will star mysteries if you guys have not checked out will star mysteries his youtube channel is very fascinating with the old historical bigfoot sightings his question for you troy is how many of these creatures would you think there are in all of North America, if you had to guess? Bigfoot does not want us to know that. <laughs> there he You're sideways. Ah. <laughs> Your video is all sideways now. And, well, we just flat lost him. Hold it. There he is. Okay, you back? Can you hear me? 
Well, maybe he can log back on. He's been having a hard time with his internet. So I appreciate you guys being patient and hanging in there with us. Um, if we can get him back, we'll carry on a little longer. If not, then we'll uh, call it an evening. There, John Hodges uh, said, David, we heard a long howl or something at our camp. John, is that the... Um, um, is uh that the same camp that you were um that, that you and i went to Hmm. Okay. Well, yo, well, Troy hadn't logged back in. So, um, so we heard a long howl or something at our camp. Uh, maybe he'll, uh, Hmm. But yeah, uh, John and I went down, um, uh, down there on the, the little river. Here. I guess that was last year now um, where he had um, had an experience down there. Okay, well, apparently uh, Troy is gone for the evening, so I am going to call it a night. And uh, you watch this later. Troy, thanks for coming on. I think we got a lot of his... Uh, got to a lot of his questions and such and um thank everybody for taking part in the in the chat had some good questions there i hope i didn't miss anybody um do the best we can so um till next time uh you guys have a good evening and take care and uh not this week i'm not going to have a tuesday not this week but the next week uh should be right back on schedule so you guys have a good night.